Thirdly, first-person methods can provide more refined first-person descriptions of subjective experience, and these descriptions can provide more refined phenomenological taxonomies and guide and inform research on the biological substrates of consciousness. So the idea is to develop some phenomenological sophistication that we can use in the context of, say, cognitive neuroscience research on consciousness. Okay, now I want to mention a specific example um, of an issue that goes to the heart of our concerns here that, um, that came up also uh, earlier this morning. Earlier I said that each transitive or object-directed experience seems to be associated with the formation of a dynamic pattern of large-scale brain activity. But now it's interesting that phenomenological frameworks as diverse as those of Husserl, Advaita Vedanta, and a number of Buddhist schools recognize another type of consciousness, what we could call an intransitive, in the sense of non-object-directed, reflexive awareness. This is described as an inner awareness of the sheer openness of the mind that doesn't involve any kind of reflection or introspection. Now, of course, these diverse phenomenologists conceptualize this in different ways, and that's important. Um, I won't go into that now. It's interesting to note that Husserl in particular shows how our most fundamental consciousness of the passage of time entails this type of open awareness, this kind of um, reflexive open awareness that isn't introspective. And he describes how it makes our consciousness self-constituting in time. That's his word. Self-constituting is really another way of saying self-organizing. But again, without any homuncular self doing the organizing, because the self or ego is an emergent result of the way that consciousness constitutes itself in time for, for Husserl. Okay, so the point I want to make now is that individuals who can generate and sustain a particular kind of contemplative mental state, a state in which one's mind reposes, awake and alert, in the so-called luminosity of this open reflexive awareness, without attending preferentially to any object or content, not ignoring, um, not, not trying to shut down the object-directed consciousness, but not biasing it in any particular way, such individuals could provide important information about core aspects of consciousness not readily apparent or accessible to ordinary introspection or reflection, and hence not currently visible to cognitive science. All right, in conclusion then, I want to make um, three points. First is that the incorporation of phenomenology into the scientific study of the mind represents a potentially profound transformation of science. It signals the limits of objectivism, that is, the standpoint that tries to ignore or deny the constitutive role of subjectivity and experience in scientific knowledge, because experience is now actually being mobilized within the scientific context. It also allows us to imagine a future mind science incorporating first-person methods of phenomenological analysis and contemplative mental training alongside more familiar experimental and mathematical techniques. So that's the first point. Second point, the incorporation of scientific knowledge into, tra into traditions of contemplative philosophy and phenomenology represents a potentially profound transformation for these traditions. Among other things, it challenges the metaphysical thesis that the fundamental nature of consciousness is non-physical, or more pointedly, non-biological. I'd like to hear more from Buddhists and Hindus who are engaged in this dialogue about how much of their core spiritual and ethical commitments are tied to this non-naturalistic view of consciousness. And this is um, connecting back to things that Owen raised this morning. Now my third point is a way of putting my own philosophical cards on the table, and here I can really just assert this, not argue it. I think consciousness will always be irreducible in a certain sense. That's not because I think consciousness has non-natural properties, but because I think it's a condition of possibility for the disclosure of any phenomenon whatsoever. Consciousness, in other words, isn't merely an empirical phenomenon in the world. It's certainly that, but it's not merely that. It's that by which the world is phenomenally manifest at all, whether in everyday life or in science. Now, to see consciousness this way is to take up a transcendental philosophical perspective, and here I'm using transcendental in the Kantian and Husserlian sense. Consciousness is irreducible because it has an inelimitable transcendental status. It's 
always already presupposed by any stance we adopt towards the world, including science. It's, um, German is wonderful, there's a word in German for this, die Unhindergebarkeit. Consciousness is the unbehindable. Sounds better in German. Now, neurophenomenology acknowledges this transcendental perspective because it follows from its resolute commitment to take experience seriously. And I'll end with that point. Thanks.